This is GPS, the global public square. Welcome to all of you in the United States and around the world. I'm Fareed Zakaria. We'll start the show with Steve Bannon exiting stage right. What will a Trump administration look like without the president's strategist? Will a deep divided country become slightly less so? Or has the die already been cast? Then, four vehicles used as weapons, plane attacks. Is there any way to protect against such acts of terror? Is this the new normal? I'll talk to Peter Bergen. Also, no one has done better than Germany in tackling an ugly past. Can America learn any lessons from it? And President Trump and the nuclear deal with Iran. The stupidest deal of all time. Why the president's disgust with that deal could lead to a major showdown next month. But first, here's my take. Much of America has reacted swiftly and strongly to Donald Trump's grotesque suggestion that there is a moral equivalence between the white supremacists who converged last weekend on Charlottesville, Virginia, and those who protested against them. But the delayed, qualified, and often neat mouth reactions of many in America's leadership class tell a disturbing story about the country's elites and the reason we are living in an age of populist rebellion. The least respected of today's leaders are, of course, politicians. The public largely views them as craven and cowardly, pandering to polls and focus groups. That is how too many Republican officials have behaved in the face of Trump's words and actions. Men and women who usually cannot stop pontificating on every topic on live TV, with some honorable exceptions, have suddenly gone mute on the biggest political subject of the day. I know, they worry about the base, about primaries, about right-wing donors. Shouldn't they also worry about their country, their conscience? Shouldn't they ask themselves why they went into public service in the first place? And if they see someone at the highest level trampling on the values of the country, shouldn't they speak up? directly, forcefully, and without qualification. Business leaders, meanwhile, are still among the most respected and envied people in America today. They run vast organizations, get paid on a scale that makes their predecessors from just 25 years ago look middle class, and live in a bubble of private planes, helicopters, and limousines. In other words, they have all the wealth, power, and security that should allow them to set standards and, well, lead. Instead, for the most part, Business leaders have also been cowards. Most of them surely think Trump is a charlatan, a snake oil salesman. In the past, many chose not to do business with him because they believed he was unethical. Others were initially amused by his candidacy, but regarded his rhetoric on trade, immigration, refugees as loathsome. Yet, almost none of them spoke out against him. Few even distanced themselves from him after he blamed many sides for the violence in Charlottesville. Had Merck CEO Kenneth Frazier not resigned from one of Trump's advisory boards, it's unclear whether others would have spoken out. And even then, some jumped ship only when it became clear there was really no alternative, after Trump doubled down on his initial comments. America once did have more public-minded elites, but they came from a small, clubby world, the Protestant establishment. Not all were born rich, but they knew they had a secure place atop the country. They populated the country's boardrooms, public offices, and its best schools. This security gave them greater comfort in exercising moral leadership. Today, we have a more merit-based elite, what is often called a meritocracy. It has allowed people from all walks of life to rise up into positions of power and influence. But these new elites are more insecure, anxious, self-centered. Politicians are likely to be solo entrepreneurs, worried about the next primary or the fundraiser. CEOs live with the constant fear that they might lose their jobs or their company might lose its customers in an instant. They may not think they have the luxury to be high-minded, but they do. They are all vastly more secure than most people in America or in human history. If they cannot act out of broader interest, who can? The group of leaders who deserve the most praise this week are the military brass. In a remarkable act of leadership for people who work under the president, all five of the heads of the armed forces independently issued statements unequivocally denouncing racism and bigotry. Perhaps this is because the military has been the institution that has most successfully integrated America's diverse population. Perhaps it is because the military remains an old-fashioned place, 
where a sense of honor, standards, and values still holds. The military chiefs have shown why they still command so much respect in the country. America's other elites should perhaps take note. For more, go to CNN.com slash Fareed and read my Washington Post column this week. Let's get started. In the wake of the Charlottesville rally and attack last weekend, the New Yorker published a fascinating, frightening article entitled, Is America Headed for a New Kind of Civil War? The reporter talked to the experts and came to some startling conclusions. What is going on in America? How did we come to this? Joining me now, Robin Wright, the reporter of that New Yorker article. She's a contributing writer for the NewYorker.com. She's also a joint fellow at the U.S. Institute of Peace and the Woodrow Wilson Center for Scholars. Angela Rai is a CNN political commentator. She is a former executive director and general counsel to the Congressional Black Caucus. Mark Lilla is a professor of the humanities at Columbia and the author of a terrific new book, The Once and Future Liberal. And Roy Blunt Jr. is an author, humorist, and former reporter. He spent his formative years in the American South. That region continues to be somewhat of a muse for him. He's written book after book about it, including a biography. Robert E. Mark Lilla, let me start with you. Steve Bannon is out of the White House, but his intellectual influence seems to still dominate in the sense that he said, uh, in effect, he said, I agree with Mark Lilla. I agree with the, the thesis of your book, which is that as long as the left plays identity politics, it's great for the right. He said, bring it on. I would love to see more of it. And it does appear that Donald Trump, whether he still has him in the White House or not, is still listening to Steve Bannon because that is the strategy the Trump administration and Trump personally is pursuing. If Steve Bannon says it works for him, I'm inclined to agree with him. Uh, he's someone who knows his business. Um, you know, uh, identity politics in this country really means two things. On the one hand, it means a focus on understanding our social problems. And to understand any problem in America, you need to understand identity. But when it comes to addressing those problems, identity politics as a strategy has been disastrous. Uh, because rather than establishing a, a connection between those who are affected by these problems and those who may be unaware of them or unaffected, you need a, to build a bridge between people. So you're saying when blacks say these are black issues, you're, you know, whites don't feel like they connect to them. Even worse than that, I think, in some of the more radical identity Oops. They say, you must understand me and my problems, and you can't understand me because you're not me, because you don't belong to my group. And that's a ter terrific turnoff to people, and uh, it's a missed opportunity to build a bridge and to see that there are certain principles, certain experiences that we share in this country. It's an opportunity to gain allies, and identity liberals just keep shooting themselves in the foot. Um, Angela, the, the problem is identity politics has been played by non-liberals as well. I mean, in a sense, the right has always played with some form of identity politics, just white identity. I mean, that's what all the dog whistles about race have been, Reagan starting his campaign in Philadelphia, Mississippi, all that stuff, right? And uh, you think about the war on drugs, you think about um, when the Tea Party uh, rose for the first time and, and they started talking about let's take our country back. You think about Donald Trump saying make America great again. What makes America not great? Well, he announced at the very first moment he uh, came down the escalator in his campaign that Mexicans were drug dealers and rapists. So it's very clear that anything other, right, is 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 wrong, is bad, is something you can't relate to and it's damaging the country. I was initially um, nervous about what you would say about identity politics. And I couldn't agree with you more about building bridges. I think the challenge is when I'm forced to communicate my issues in a way that's digestible or comforting to you, then that means that I'm uncomfortable. And so where is the bridge that goes both ways to ensure that we can have a dialogue where we are fostering understanding? And I think for me, as an African-American person, I often find myself on the defense, not just because someone can't relate to me, but because so often I'm in the minority. So it's a minority view a minority person that you assume is angry. So there's so many hurdles you have to overcome just to get across that bridge. But your point is find those issues that yeah. unite, economic issues, right. issues of redistribution, right? I mean, most even more. 
interpreting what the problem is. For example, I'm not a black male motorist. I will never be a black male motorist, and I will never fully understand what it's like to uh, to be in a situation where you look in the rearview mirror and you see the lights going. However, um, I am a citizen, and I understand what it means not to be equally protected under the law. And if you put the experience under a principle we all share, then people can identify. But if you say that you cannot understand my experience because of your background, you're inviting people to close the door. So, uh, uh, Robin Wright, this gets to the, it seems to me, the fundamental issue at, in your article, which is that we seem to be so far apart. Um, we seem to be so far apart as a country. What I've been struck by in the last few days is the stunning degree of support for Donald Trump's position after Char Charlottesville, uh, the very high support for uh, maintaining every Confederate monument. Uh, these are, you know, these are in the 70 percent range for Republicans, I think the 80 percent range on some, depending on how you ask the, the question. Um, and that gets to your article. Is this, is this gulf so wide that you think, uh, after, on the basis of that reporting, we really are in for a new kind of uh, civil strife, if not civil war? Well, I think no one's talking about the kind of pitch battles along neat geographic lines that characterized the Civil War 150 years ago. What people are talking about is low-intensity conflict with sporadic, episodic violence uh, that results in calling out the National Guard and that challenges traditional political authority. I think you've seen a number of conditions in this country that get far beyond identity politics, although emerge from identity politics, and that's the polarization, with no middle ground, no meeting place to resolve it. It's the weakened institutions, such as the courts, and uh, it's the abandonment of the higher moral ground by leadership. It's the legitimization of violence as a means of engaging in discourse or resolving disputes that there are a lot of things that are very worrisome. Now, I am a child. I went to college in the late 60s and the early 70s uh, during the period of the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement. And uh, the United States has, in the past, had a process of self-correction through the courts or through legislation. We got back on track. What's worrisome now is that you find that the leadership in the country is not taking that higher moral ground, and it is fanning the flames of polarization. And the firing of Steve Bannon is not going to get us uh, beyond this moment in history, beyond the divisiveness. Uh, the problem started long before Charlottesville, and, and the danger is that because of the kind of support we see by uh, so many behind Donald Trump, that this is something that is going to be with us for quite a while. Roy, how much of this is the South? How much of this is the, the, the you know, the fact that we have never completely come to terms with, that I think about it because, you know, when people say, well, there's some similarity to the, the Germans dealt with their past. Well, the Germans dealt with their past partly because it is absolutely clear in modern German interpretation that Goebbels and Himmler and Rommel and all of uh, the Nazi henchmen were bad, terrible, evil people. You would never find a, a statue to them. There is ambivalence about Robert E. Lee. Yeah, well, Robert E. Lee was a symbol. I mean, the South, not just the South, but the whole country seemed to need somebody after the Civil War. The Civil War, the horrible, sordid carnage. It was just a, a horrible thing. The more you read about it, it's just disgusting. War. So they put up a statue. There's a statue in Augusta, Georgia, that says, carved on it, "No nation rose so white and fair, unfell so pure of crime." That's just like standing out in the corner and saying, "We never did anything. We didn't. We're, we're, we're embarrassing. It's ludicrous." So to me, I'd love to take. But and Robert E. Lee was a living statue, or recently a deceased statue. Supposedly pure, and you know, he had he never earned a demerit at West Point, and uh, and he was a much more complicated man than he was held up to be. We've got to come back, and when we come back, I want to come right back to this issue that Robin Wright raises, which is just how 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 much political conflict and strife are we in for going forward? And we are back with Robin Wright. 
Andrew Rai, Mark Lilla, and Roy Blunt Jr. Mark, I want to come back to you to ask about again going forward. It does seem as though the Trump strategy right now is go to your base and play this game of white identity politics. Will it will it reinforce a kind of diehard opposition? What should the left do? Your book is written as, as you put it, as a once and future liberal. Um, you don't want them to play identity politics, but what do you do if the other side is playing identity politics? Well, the first thing you realize, you have to recognize is that it works for them and it doesn't work for us. But beyond that, uh, I, I think what's important here, and it, it showed up in Robin Wright's article, is that there's some glue that's missing in this country, something that keeps us together. We're dr it's not so much a word loggerheads, but we're drifting apart. Um, there once used to be a democratic vision, a uh, democratic party vision, a liberal vision of what we stood for as a nation, what made us citizens, how we could work together in a political way uh, on the basis of solidarity and uh, equal protection. Then there was a Reagan view, which was that the less government, the better. We're all by ourselves in our families and churches, and good luck to you. That vision. Uh, was destroyed by Donald Trump. He destroyed Reagan's party. And now neither party and neither ideology. And in a sense, you're saying liberals never had a response to Reagan's vision. They just kind of retreated into identity politics. Exactly. That was a time, you see, Reagan's vision was anti-political. And it was a time for liberals to make the case for democratic political life and the legitimacy of government and the legitimacy of, of helping each other out. And by retreating, they made a, a tactical mistake, I think. And I, I, I don't think many people have a sense, and I don't think Democrats have a sense, of what their vision of the future was, uh, is. I mean, if you listen to the rhetoric of JFK or FDR or Reagan, you very quickly get a sense of what kind of world they want to, want to create. We don't have that with, without a national narrative. Without ideologies that even bring parties together, uh, we become like elementary particles flying apart, and that's when trouble starts. Angela Rai, how, how, do, how, how do you bring the Democrats or, or the country together? Well, I think first on the Democratic part, obviously, um, as a Democrat, at least someone who votes Democrat, I disagree a little bit. I think recently they've introduced a plan that leans more into economics, which, of course, is a more unifying principle. Um, and I think that there's a struggle when you are known to be a big tent, right? There are a lot of different interests that you have to cater to. And I think that um, historically Democrats have struggled to figure out what is that sweet spot, um, as well as this country that some folks call melting pot. I prefer jambalaya. Um, because we're all different, and I, I like that we can appreciate differences. Um, the only path forward, I think, is to begin to tell the truth about our history. It's one that is troubled. It's one that is challenging, full of conflicts, and full of hypocrisy. And until we can embrace what that narrative is, as uncomfortable as it might be for some, we're not going to get further ahead. Robin Wright, that seems to me to be a recipe for more conflict, because as we tell that history, there are a lot of people uh, who will say that's not my history, and uh, as Roy Blunt was saying, that's you know that, that, that you're 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 politicizing it, or uh, I just feel like you're going to get a backlash. Well, we haven't we haven't resolved many of the issues that, that surfaced during the Civil War, including how do you ensure uh, people of color not only voting rights but equal rights, and so there are a number of haunting. Uh, questions that still have to be addressed. The 14th Amendment is still deeply uh, divisive in this country. One of the things that's striking about parties is if you look at the period that in the run up to the Civil War, you saw the disintegration of the two parties, the disintegration of the Whig Party that opened the way for the Republicans and the emergence of Abraham Lincoln and the Democrats dividing into Northern and Southern Democrats. Uh, that there are some kind of uncanny parallels and some haunting questions that this nation has not move together to try to resolve, and it plays out in this issue of statues. How ironic, pieces of steel. Roy Blunt, you covered the civil rights movement in the early 60s. You interviewed Martin Luther King. It seems to me Robin Wright's article really uh, suggests that what we might end up with is not, the, not another civil war, but another period like the late 50s uh, and 60s, where you had, you know, deep political divisions, some violence, uh, a kind of conflict that didn't seem like it could be mediated. 
What seems di what seems silly and similar, and what seems different? Well, I was living in the South then. Uh, you had uh, the uh, lot, the majority was on majority of white people were on the wrong side, and so were the majority of the governors and uh, police. But um, at the national level, at the in the White House, uh, we had Kennedy and Johnson, and they were they were pretty good. But now we have uh, all the way to the top. It's, I mean, we've got a president who can't tell the difference between Nazis and anti-Nazis. Um, and that makes it, that's very unsettling, very confusing, and very encouraging to the Nazis. Um, and so, in some ways, it's, it's more uh, indefinite and scarier now. I think. People haven't, I don't even want to get into shooting. There was lots of that in the Civil Rights Movement, and there are lots of guns out there now. On that sobering note, you have to leave us. Right. <laughs> Thank you all. Next on GPS, from Charlottesville to Spain, cars and trucks used as weapons. Peter Bergen will tell us how we should think of this new favorite tactic, terror. May have popped the proverbial champagne a little too soon. The former White House chief strategist has rejoined Breitbart News, and he's made it clear he is still going to fight for the Trump agenda, saying, quote, in many ways, I think I can be more effective fighting from the outside for the agenda President Trump ran on. And anyone who stands in our way, we will go to war with. Ending a sentence with a preposition notwithstanding. Joining me now is Democratic Congressman uh, Adam Schiff, Chairman of the House, uh, I'm sorry, Ranking Member of the House Intelligence Committee. Uh, Congressman, good to see you as always. Good to see you, Jake. So in response to President Trump's firing of Bannon, you tweeted, quote, glad to see Bannon gone. He never belonged in the White House, but the problem persists since the most profound source of division cannot be fired. Um, your position on, on President Trump and Bannon clear there. But let me ask you, is there anyone else in the White House that you think should not be there? You know, there's certainly a lot of people on the White House staff and NSC staff that uh, shouldn't be there, people like Miller and Gorka and others uh, who uh, not only, I think, represent the same thing that Steve Bannon did, but uh, aren't capable of doing the job well. Uh, so yes, I think there's more cleaning house uh, that ought to take place. But as I mentioned uh, in that tweet, Jake, the, the more fundamental problem is at the very top. Uh, I think what the president had to say about the demonstrations uh, in Boston and elsewhere was perfectly fine, perfectly unobjectionable, but perfectly inadequate uh, after that debacle of a press conference he had supposedly on infrastructure. You know, the real, I, I think, challenge and job for the chief executive in a country where race has always been such a difficult conversation is to do everything possible to bring our country together. Uh, to help uh, uh, make us a more perfect union. And what the president did this week uh, was as if he stood on a line dividing the country uh, and pushed uh, to separate uh, one American from another with all his might. Uh, and that is not what this country needs. After President Trump's comments uh, appearing to equate white supremacists and the counter-protesters, your fellow uh, Democrat on the House Intelligence Committee, uh, Jackie Speer, tweeted, quote, POTUS is showing signs of erratic behavior and mental instability that place the country in grave danger. Time to invoke the 25th Amendment. That's the amendment that would allow the removal of the president. Do you agree that President Trump is mentally unstable? Well, I certainly think that there's uh, an issue with the president's capability. There's some attribute of his character that uh, makes him uh, seemingly incapable of introspection and, and, and uh, a broad understanding of what the country really needs. Uh, and I think it's a, a question that people are asking, uh, you know, what is going on with this president? What can explain this kind of behavior? Uh, you know, it began at the very beginning, Jake. I remember when he had won the election and within days seemed to suggest that the only reason he didn't win the popular vote was that millions of people uh, illegally came to the country and voted. Uh, and I thought to myself, oh, my God, this man is not only going to not grow with the job, but uh, is willing to say things that are just patently untrue. I'm convinced you, if you took somebody off the street of America and you said you've just become president, but here's the deal. You didn't win the popular vote. They would have the common sense to say, look, I'm going to do everything I can to win over everyone. I realize that many people, indeed most people, didn't vote for me. But, but he didn't do that. He's not capable of doing that. And I don't understand why. Uh, but I do recognize what a serious problem it is, and I think more than when I say it or when Jackie Spear says it, the fact that Bob Corker uh, now says things along the same lines uh, shows a broadening recognition uh, that uh, there are some serious issues with our president that aren't going to go away, that aren't going to get better, and indeed, with the pressures of the job, may very well get worse 
Uh, and I think for that reason, at a minimum, we need the very best people around him in the White House. Uh, and, uh, and that means that not people like Bannon, not people like Miller, not people like Gorka, uh, but rather some uh, more adults in the room. It sounds like you're saying that you don't disagree with Jackie Speer, who said that President Trump is showing signs of erratic behavior, mental instability. And it, so it sounds like you're not disagreeing with that. What about the, the 25th Amendment part, which would call for the removal of the president? Are you, are you, do you agree with that? Uh, you know, I don't think we're at a point of thinking about the 25th Amendment. Uh, you know, for one thing, this is something that the vice president and cabinet would need to come together on. I think what uh, the authors of that amendment principally had in mind was some kind of physical incapacitation or serious mental illness or a breakdown, uh, an inability to function in office. Uh, and I think we're still far from con concluding that that's the case, even though we find uh, many of us, uh, his conduct anathema uh, and there to be a serious problem here. Uh, but I, I don't think it, uh, you know, particularly at this point uh, in time makes a lot of sense to focus on the 25th Amendment. I do think it means that we have to put real constraints on this president. We have to make sure that our system of checks and balances in Congress work. I think, frankly, the most powerful thing we could do rather than pursue the 25th Amendment at this point is make sure that one house or the other, and ideally both, are in Democratic hands, frankly, the hands of a party, not in the White House, to be a more effective check on on some of the damage this president can do. Congressman, let me ask you, President Trump was obviously widely condemned um, for his comments in which he seemed to be equating both sides for the violence and hatred in Charlottesville. But obviously, let's remove the idea that there's any moral equivalence. Is there any legitimacy to the argument that the violent tactics of groups like Antifa make matters worse and that Democrats and progressives need to condemn them? You know, anyone that's committing uh, violence uh, ought to be condemned. Anyone. Uh, there's no justification for it whatsoever. Uh, but I do think that that uh, cannot be allowed to obscure the fact that millions of people are gathering around the country and have since uh, this president was inaugurated in the most peaceful form of protests. Uh, and we can't allow the commander in chief to somehow equate the handful of people that would uh, make those protests violent uh, with any kind of sentiment that condones uh, white supremacy or neo-Nazism. Uh, and I think it all gets back to the point you made earlier, Jake. And I think it, it, the, the fundamental problem here is that the President of the United States can't bring himself to repudiate a part uh, of, of his support, and that is that small group of uh, bigots uh, that are supporters of his. He's uh, taken a position essentially that if you're with me, you can do no wrong. Uh, and I won't condemn you practically anything what, uh, that you do. Uh, his difficulty during the campaign in your interview to condemn David Duke uh, is not at all unlike the difficulty he's had this week in a full-throated, unequivocal repudiation of, of uh, sentiment and an ideology that we not only find repugnant, but we mm -hmm. fought uh, a world war uh, over. So uh, I think that's the root of the problem. Congressman Adam Schiff, Democrat of California, thank you so much. Good to see you as always, sir. Thank you, Jake. One Republican senator now saying he worries that there's more violence to come, and he says he doubts President Trump can bring the country together in the event that that happens. That's next.